think about it. All right, today is the 11th of April, and with me is Eli, and we will get going on our uh, um, Bible study. We missed a couple weeks. We had a death in the family, and and uh, if you guys could be praying for my wife, I would appreciate it. She, her mother had passed away at 91 here this past week. And then prior to that, we had some sickness. So we were not able to record, but we're getting back into the swing of things this week and we'll get going here. And so I'll go ahead and open up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. We thank you for your many blessings and ask that you be with us tonight and ask that you work our uh, our thoughts and our minds and our voices to your glory father and to, to uh, glorify you in all that we do tonight in this study of um, ephesians 6 the last part father we just thank you for opening up your word to us and giving us insight into what is being said here father in these days that we live in and we thank you for your many blessings, and we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get going. Today's the 11th of April. And we're, again, we're in Ephesians. And I call this the Ephesians Strategy, Chapter 6, Part 2. And we should finish up tonight, depending on how fast I go here. Um, one of the things we have to understand is in today's age, we are being attacked in several ways uh, through the ancient gods that we uh, have out there. We see them in our different cor corporations. We see them on what Hollywood and the TV and magazines and newspapers are pushing. And it's just, you know, if you know what to see, it's everywhere, everywhere. So one of the things we do have to talk about just for a short time, National Day of Prayer is coming up on May 2nd. And here in Whitehall, we're going to meet at the pavilion down by the fire hall on the 2nd at 1 o'clock. And so that verses that we're using are out of 2 Samuel 22, uh, verses 29 to 31. And uh, But one of the things that we need to do for our National Day of Prayer is our country needs to beg for uh, forgiveness and repentance. And that's the big thing that we need to be doing. And that starts in the home. Okay. So we need to be good Bereans. And I always tell folks to don't take our word for whatever we say. Go look it up in the scriptures and make sure it is uh, accurate and uh, con continue to read the scriptures and learn. And we're going to get into some tonight that is going to be really interesting for most people. And we need to study the Bible from a biblical perspective. And there's a, we're going to get into that in, next week if we can. If not, we will get into it the week after. And uh, a couple things we have to keep in mind. Is it revealed to a prophet? Does it change God or Jesus and our two or three witness to the um, idea or principle? And is it being, uh, are these witnesses agreeing on it or demonstrating it? Okay. Um, one of the things we need to understand too is that there are some things that were renewed in the sacrifice. Uh, we, we no longer need the sacrifices of bulls and calves. We have the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That was one of the things that was uh, uh, improved. And the temple, we no longer have a stone temple. We have a flesh temple. Our body is the temple. In the, and then also we're the priest. We no longer need a priest. We're the priest of our temple. And the storage of the word is no longer in a gold box known as the Ark of the Covenant, but it is in our, in us, in our hearts, in our minds. So it all works together in this uh, uh, second. And those are the th big things that have uh, improved. It's the sacrifice, the temple, the priest, and the uh, storage of the word. And we're gonna look at this as we are the clay pot, that's our body, and our wick is our works. And we can do all the works that we want, but if we do not have Jesus Christ behind it, which is the spark that he gives us, 
or we do not have the oil, which is his loving instructions that he has given us, then it doesn't work well. I mean, people don't see much. But if we have all these things going properly, then we can be a really good light. And that's part of all of this justification and uh, righteousness is um, through. Um, oh, the light went out. Sorry, guys. Is through. No um, wonder. No, that's right. Uh, where was I? I lost my place. We'll just keep going. <clears throat> Anyways, we need to do all these things to be a, a good light to the world. And it is, we can't earn our justification. That is something that we have through faith. We're given that. So, all right. Now, the family. We have two parts of the family. We have a mother and a father. And the father is our covering in the family. And our mother is the support system. And Jesus Christ demonstrates both of these. And... Uh, Psalm 91, 4, he will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. We'll talk about more of that tonight. And that's part of the armor, too. And support is the wife. And Matthew 20, 15 through 16, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you uh, begrudge my generosity so the last will be first and the first last? But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And he demonstrates the support system. And again, in the family, our first fruits are our children. And what we're going to see with that, I'm not going to go through this one, we went through that last week. But what we're going to see with that, really important is our 144,000 that are coming up, well, 12,000 from each tribe, and they need to be um, virgins of Babylon, and it starts in the family, and that's where they start learning these things, and this is something that we need to be conscientious of so we can start training our children up correctly, and, you know, I don't know if it's going to be this generation, next generation, you know, or if it's the one already, you know, uh, our generation right now. And remember, children are to grow into the roles fulfilled by the parents and honor those roles. So really important. And we talked about this just a little bit. And uh, these 144,000, uh, they have godly loving parents. They're uh, redeemed from mankind's first fruits. They're not defiled or blameless and no lies are found in their mouth. And they sing a new song and they follow the lamb. So one of the things we're we're talking about is getting back to the 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 song that was sung for Moses, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Moms and dads will raise and dedicate their first fruits who are not defiled, blameless, found with no lies in their mouth, singing a new song and following the Lamb of Yahweh. They'll be redeemed of the earth in the last days. So this is something new. This was out of Deuteronomy eleven eighteen through twenty five. And I didn't go over this last uh, last time, two weeks, yeah, last time that we had Bible study. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign, excuse me, on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house and when you are walking by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house. And let's see, and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that your Lord swore to your fathers to give them as long as the heavens are above the earth. For if you will be careful to do these commandments that I command you to do the loving to do. Um, loving the Lord your God, walking in all his ways, holding fast to him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations before you, and you will dispose nations or dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Every place in which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. 
and your territory shall be from the wilderness to Lebanon. It goes on and talks about that from the Old Testament. But the principle is knowing these words, and these words are his Torah. Okay. One of the things we have to understand about Paul is that uh, and we'll go through. That's one of the things we're going to go through is what he knew in the Old Testament. Again, we'll talk about that a little bit. But he talks about the armor of God is not a new invention, but it's an amalgamation of metaphors used in the First Testament. Paul gathers these ideas and brings them to life in the same metaphor, giving the reader a sense of urgency, confidence, training, and knowledge. And he uses the image also, uh, and that's the image of uh, armor. Uh, it's also prevalent to his contemporary Jews and Greeks because they're around you know, the Roman soldiers are around all the time, so they understand what this armor is. And uh, in the Jews are used to the uh, the priests because they would wear in armor as well. And so both of them had some representation. And uh, Paul, you know, being a smart felon, knew this. Some say he had the image of the Israelite high priest in mind when he wrote this. But being a teacher, he most likely had something in mind which most people in that day could identify. And a Roman soldier admired and feared and stood out in most every Roman providence and surrounding territory. And we cannot discount the high priest as Paul was a distinguished Pharisee. So Peter talks a little bit about Paul. So we have to understand something about Paul. And Peter says, this is in chapter 3, 2 Peter verses 13 through 18. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish. And it's important to understand the new heavens and a new earth because God uses these as witnesses. And we don't have a new heaven and a new earth yet. So we still have to stand by. So we have to understand what Paul was writing about. So that's why that's important. Therefore, beloved, since you're waiting for these, be diligent to be found by uh, by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. As he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand which the ignorant and unstable. And the question is, is what are they ignorant of and unstable of? What was Paul a big student? It was the, the scriptures. He was a, a, a huge student in the scriptures. He knew them inside and out. In fact, he had memorized the, you know, the, the Tanakh, the, the Torah, the writings, and the, and the prophets. He had those all memorized. And um, probably in both Hebrew and Greek. And so... He, that's what he's drawing from. But people that don't understand that, you know, go back to the scriptures. They, they have, they can get confused easily and they'll, they'll twist to their own destruction. Can you close that door? Sorry, guys. Our dogs are yakking there. So, um, is that there's some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the air of lawlessness, or air of lawless people, and lose your stability. So don't become lawless. Understand what, what the word says. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be the glory both now and through the day of eternity. So there's a lot in there. So what he's saying is know, know the law. You know, you hear today people say, well, you're a legalistic. Well, I have yet to find that word being used in Scripture, saying you're too legalistic. But I certainly find the word saying, don't be lawless. And, you know, Christ is after the lawless one. So remember, Paul's a walking library. We talked about this. He knows the scriptures inside and out. He has them memorized, probably both Hebrew and Greek. And like you and me, we have to use a computer to find out everything that Paul knew. So he was just a walking computer. 
Um, Acts 22, 3 through 5, Paul says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Sicily, uh, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. I per persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of the elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there, bringing them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. Acts 5, 33 through 36. When they heard this, they were in, uh, enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you're about to do with these men. For before these days, Theodos rose up claiming to be somebody and the number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed and all who followed him disappeared and came to nothing. So Gamiel is a really smart man. He's saying, hey, this sect of the way, you know, if it's true, we don't want to be messing with it. But if it isn't, it'll just go by the way of uh, um Yes. So that is one of the things that uh, he was very intelligent that way. So we're going to bring the Old Testament, New Testament, the First and Second Testaments together in our tonight's study. And again, we have the armor of God that we're going to be talking about, Hebraic or Roman. Um, I think they were both, personally. I got to go shut my dogs up. I'll be right back. Sorry. The front door was window was open, so they were looking out, and there's people walking, so they're yakking and carrying on. So sorry. All right. So we're going to start in Second Samuel. This was back in the um, the prophets, and uh, this was a, a chapter that Paul knew well. So we'll read through it, and you'll see when we get through it, you'll see what we're talking about. Kind of give us a basis of Paul's understanding. A summary of it anyways. I mean, there's so much there that I didn't know what to pick from. So I just grabbed this because it was pretty, pretty interesting. So 2 Samuel 22, I think there's 40 verses. We're going to read them all. And David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day. And the reason I do that, I believe that the words of the Bible are more important than my words. A lot of people will read a little bit of scripture and then expound on it. And I think we're backwards. We need to have less commentary and more scripture. And uh, so, anyways, verse 1. And David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge. My Savior, you save me from violence. And here's shields. These are the horns he's talking about. And here's a stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. And these are all parts of being a soldier. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. For the waves of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I called. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry came to his ears. In the cords of Sheol, the spirits. And we look at dimensions, dimensionality. Did we talk about this last time? No. You, you recall? Okay. So, um, in the string, super string theory, they believe there's 10 dimensions, and um, oh, and I forget which one it was. I, I won't go there. But anyways, um, 
we live probably in the first three, maybe fourth dimension is time if you want to count that. So, you know, however you want it. But they figure that um, dimension zero is subspace or Sheol. And if you take a day here, I'm sorry, um, you take a day here, it says a thousand years here. It, when you calculate it out using mathematical equations. And we have that. Doesn't that sound something familiar in the Bible? Yes. Yeah. So a lot of this stuff, if you look at it in the Bible, it, it comes out um, pretty um, uh, evenly. We find that the Bible is way ahead of itself. So anyways, this is talking about the spiritual realm. And we're living in here, and this is all the stuff that we don't know about. And what I tell people, too, is Jesus came to earth, and he had a physical body. But, you know, Jesus and God are the same. Now, if God were to come to earth in a physical, he couldn't fit. Because God's outside of this. He couldn't fit. And the Ancient of Days is even uh, bigger than that. And so, you know, Yahweh, he could come in and be present, you know, in spirit, but not in a physical body. So it was, um, it, we see different parts of God depending on the dimensions that we're in. Some people look at me like I have three heads. And that's thus according to Wes. That's just my theory. I, you know, I don't know if we can prove that biblically, but it, uh, it, to me, it, it really makes a lot of sense. So, but anyways, and again, this is, we can see a lot of stuff that's true in here in the Bible. So, um, again, we got to study it out more, you know, so. All right, move on. Verse 8, then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because he was angry, God. Smoke went up from his nostrils, devouring fire from his mouth, and glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He was seen on the wings of the wind. He made darkness around him, his canopy, thick clouds and gathering water. Out of the brightness before him, coals of fire flamed forth. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundation of the world were laid bare at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. He sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from the strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanliness of my hands, he rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and I have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me. And from his statutes, I did not turn aside. I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from guilt. And the Lord was rewarded me accordingly to my righteousness, according to my cleanliness or cleanness in his sight. And the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight, with the merciful who show yourselves merciful, and with the blameless man you show yourself blameless. With, you know, I want to look at something. Did I put, yeah, I put 25 in there twice. With purified, you deal purely, and with the crooked, you make yourself seem torturous. You save a humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. For you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God lightens my darkness. For by you, I can run against a troop, and by my God, I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. His shield for all, or he is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord, and who is a rock except our God? The God is my strong refuge and has made my way blameless. In a stronghold, you have a good rock for a stronghold. He made me, uh, made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation, and your gentleness made me great. You gave a wide place for my steps under me, and my feet did not slip. 
I pursued my enemies, destroyed them, and did not turn back until they were consumed. I consumed them. I thrust them through so that they did not rise. They fell under my feet. For you equipped me with the strength for the battle. You made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me, those who hated me, and I destroyed them. They looked, but there was none to save. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. I beat them fine as the dust of the earth. I crushed them and stamped them down like the mire of the streets. You delivered me from strife with my people. You kept me as the head of the nations, people whom I had not known served me. Foreigners came cringing, cringing to me, and as soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock, exalted by my God, the rock of my salvation. The God who gave me vengeance and brought down peoples under me, who brought me out from my enemies, who exalted me above those who rose against me, who delivered me from the men of violence. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations and sing praises to your name. Great salvation he brings to this, to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. So in the last days, who's going to be doing that? It's going to be Jesus Christ be doing that as well. So, all right. Paul's authority established from scriptures. Romans 15, 4, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instructions. So this is Paul writing. And so the Tanakh was written in former days. That was the, the Torah, the uh, Ketavim, and the, uh, well, the prophets and the writings. Um, the law of the prophets and the writings. And that was what was written in former days. And it was written for their instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, again, that's what the scriptures are, we might have hope. Now, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus, Paul. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. And we've talked about what he knew. And he had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things according to or concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he he had not met Jesus face to face when Jesus walked the earth, but he did afterwards when he had his conversion. Second uh, Peter three fifteen through sixteen, we read about this on account of patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them with of these matters there are some things in which uh, in in them that are hard to understand which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures so that you really have to understand the first testament to really understand what paul was talking about second timothy 3:16 all scriptures breathed by god and profitable for teaching for reproof for correction and for the training of the righteousness and what I tell people is when you go back and you see when this stuff was written, that some churches had some of the New Testament letters, but not all of them. And what they're referring here to is the is the what we call the Old Testament is what they're referring to. And now that doesn't mean we throw away the, the New Testament. The New Testament is commentary on the old. And there's some really good stuff. But the understand it, if we don't understand the first testament, we're not going to understand the second. So that's why it's so important. Finally, be strong as Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And we're going to look just quickly where they talk about um, the uh, principalities and rulers of the darkness. Lying spirits, 1 Kings 22, 19 through 22. And Micah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing beside him. So we're in that spiritual realm. And on his right hand and on his left, and the Lord said, who will entice Ahab? that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilgad, Gilead. And one said one thing and another said another. Then a spirit came forward. So he's talking to these spirits. And it came forward and stood before the Lord saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, 
by what means? And he said, I will go out and will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, you are to entice him, and you shall succeed and go out and do so. So we see the spiritual realm there. And again, we need to have more than one source. And God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem. And the leaders of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. So he sent out an evil spirit. So you can go into Acts 16, 16 through 18 and look at spirits of divination. Uh, Numbers 530, spirits of jealousy. A harmful spirit is talked about in 1 Samuel 16, 16. Uh, a spirit of skill. That's interesting. In Exodus 28, 3, you shall speak to all the skillful whom I have filled with a spirit of skill that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. So some spirits are good. Wisdom, Deuteronomy 34, 9, a spirit of wisdom. Isaiah 11, 2, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. We've got some other spirits. Ephesians 16, 6, 13, the whole armor of God. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. So the whole armor of God. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and have, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And again, we're going to look at some of the things that Paul was referencing and it, it, it's a metaphor you know sometimes they use different pieces of the metaphor to mean different things but you put it all together and what you're going to see is it's the word of god and the presence of god and his spirit that get us through and it's how we use those things so isaiah 11 5 righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins where do we get righteousness and faithfulness him. Through God, yeah, He's our strength, and that's that's where we get it. So, you know, when it starts, when our faithfulness starts to waver, God, I need more faithfulness. You know, I mean, that's that's just that's the smart thing to do. It's where you run. You know, Saul and uh, David. Saul ran to the dead. David ran to life. As David ran to God, Saul ran to the mediums and spirits to get. So he ran to death. You know, so that's. That's real simple. It's where you run. Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of whom him who brings good news. That's inter interesting. Who publishes peace. It's also interesting. Who brings good news of happiness. Who publishes salvation. Who says to Zion, your God reigns. So, you know, we're talking about the feet who bring good news. And for your feet, having the redness of the gospel of peace. Good news publishes peace. So it was talked about, and what I'm getting at is, you know, some people will say, well, Ephesians, that's all new. Uh, Paul was relying on the Old Testament, the First Testament, and this is where he's getting this stuff from. Isaiah 59, 16 through 17, he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede, Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in the zeal of a cloak. Again, we're, we're looking at that metaphor. In all circumstances, this is Ephesians 6, 16 through 18a. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. And um, you ever hear of Chuck Missler? Would I to talk to you about him? No, you didn't mention okay. that. Okay. He's a wonderful Bible teacher, and uh, he's, he's since passed on, I think like 2019 when he passed away. But uh, when he would teach uh, Ephesians, he would you know, go through the whole armor of God. And then, you know, as a, and he was a military guy. And he says, then you can go ahead and put on the armor of God, but you take out the big guns and the big guns is praying. <laughs> so I'll never forget that. That was good. I like that. Yeah. Psalms 18 verse 30. As for God, his way is perfect. 
the word of the Lord is tried. Um, he is a buckler to all those that trust him. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation. We read through this a little bit. And again, this is uh, also part of that metaphor. And I didn't know if you knew the difference between a shield and a buckler. I didn't, but bucklers are smaller than a shield. I didn't know that. And you can wield them better, you know, when you're fighting with a, a sword. So this is more for uh, defense, and this is more offense, from what I understand. Okay, belt of truth, Nehemiah 9.13. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws, good statutes and commandments. Your righteousness is righteousness forever, and your law is true, Psalm 119.142. Psalm 119, 151, but you are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are true. So we're talking about the belt of truth. And this is known as laws, his statutes, and his commandments. Breastplate, breastplate of righteousness. Deuteronomy 4, 8. And what a great nation is there that his statutes and rules so righteous as all the law, this law that I set before you today. Statutes, rules are righteous. 119, 142, your righteousness is a righteousness forever, and your law is true. The Lord was pleased for his righteousness' sake to magnify his law and to make it glorious. Isaiah 48, 18, oh, that you had paid attention to my commandments, then your peace would have been like a river, and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Isaiah 51, 7, listen to me. You who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law, fear not the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revelings. Ezekiel 185, I'm sorry, 18 verses 5 through 9. If a man is righteous and does what is just and right, if he does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife, or approach a woman in her time of menstrual impurity, does not oppress anyone, but restores to the debtor his pledge, commits no robbery, gives his bread to the hungry, covers the naked with a garment, does not lend at interest or take any profit, withholds his hand from injustice, executes true justice between man and man, walks in my statutes, and keeps my rules by acting faithfully. He is righteous. He shall surely live, declares the Lord. So and the reason I put that all in there is this is throughout all of the uh, First Testament as things that God tells us to do, how to behave, how to treat one another. And it's real simple. We follow what he tells us to the best of our abilities. Now, people will say, well, we can't do that. That's why we need Jesus. Absolutely correct. But when we make a mistake or we screw up, which way do we run? We run to God and beg for forgiveness. You know, we don't go to death. We run to God. Now, the first time the gospel is talked about in um, the Bible, the two places, this is uh, the second place. Um, and we'll talk about the first place in a little bit. But I don't know if I talked to you about this or not. No. Um, we went through it at church at one time. And it's out of the Koinia house. This is a Chuck Missler again. But what he does is he takes the genealogy from Adam to Noah and goes in and finds the meaning of the names and takes the roots of the, that make up the names and finds out those meanings and then puts those meanings together. And some people think he's nuts. But if you really look at it, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. And so what he found is the meaning of Adam means man. The meaning of Seth is appointed. The meaning of Enosh is mortal. The meaning of Kenan is sorrow. And in some Bibles, it's Canaan, but it's been transliterated. I think it's the right word incorrectly, and it should be Kenan if you go look at the way it is in the in the Hebrew. Mahalalel is the blessed God. Yared shall come down. Enoch means teaching. Methuselah, his death shall bring. Lamech, the despairing, 
and Noah rest and comfort. You put it all together. Man appointed mortal sorrow. The blessed God shall come down, teaching his death shall bring the despairing rest and comfort. There's the gospel message right there mm. in the, the names of the, you know, when we're reading through them, this is in Genesis 5. You're reading through them. It's like, what's this mean? You know, and nothing's put in the Bible. I mean, there's always there's always a good reason why it's put in the Bible. Now it's up to you and me to figure out what that is. And so, and whoever else is reading it, and, and then share it with other people. So the gospel in the, the first uh, testament or the old testament, and this is, is in Genesis 3, that was in Genesis 5, in 8 through 19, and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden. This is after they uh, had eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, God, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And it's interesting to go back. And God said, he didn't say not to just eat the fruit. He said, do not eat of the tree of the good knowledge of good and evil. And I looked up, there's several things that you can eat from a tree. Did you know that? Like the inner bark, nuts, and some you can eat the leaves on some. And it was interesting. I didn't know that, realize that you can make tea out of some of it. And so it was like, whoa, okay. And so when I read what God said to Adam, he said, don't eat of the tree of the good knowledge of good and evil. It was like, okay. And again, it's probably a metaphor, but you know, I'm going to leave that there. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And she shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So we see this fight between the the heavenlies, which is the, the seed of the serpent. And there's all kinds of things we can get into there, but it's just the spiritual realm fighting with the physical realm. And who comes down from the into the physical realm? The son of God. And... So that is her offspring, and shall bruise his head, and you shall bruise his heel. And the woman said, I will surely multiply it. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you should not eat of, cursed is the ground. Because of you, in pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. And by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And what did you do all day? Farmed. Farmed. You're tired. Yeah. You worked hard. Yes. Yeah. Bingo. Right there. <laughs> so you're a witness. <laughs> Yep. Uh, Isaiah 53, 1 through 12. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and as one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised. He was esteemed, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. This is a prophecy of the good news. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put on him, uh, put to him grief. When his soul makes an offering uh, for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied, and his knowledge shall the righteous one. My servant make many to be counted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. That's the gospel message again. Uh, Leviticus 17.11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it's the blood that makes atonement by the life. Psalm 32, 5, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So there's that forgiveness of sin. Zechariah 3, 1 through 5, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem. Rebuke you. It's not, uh, is not this the brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed in filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him, and to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord was standing by. So what do we get clothed with? Righteousness, right? So again, this is this is foreshadowing the, the gospel. John 5, 45, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. Luke 16, 31, he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced that somebody should rise from the dead. So if we don't know the Moses and the prophets, how are we going to know uh, what it means when someone rises from the dead? Luke 24, 27, and beginning with Moses and the prophets, he this is on the road to Emmaus. So he begins with Moses and the prophets, in which is the law of the prophets and the, the writing. So he's talking to them about scriptures. He interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And to this day, Acts 26, 22, to this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what? The prophets and Moses said would come to pass. So again, we're looking at the prophets and Moses. Galatians 3, 5 through 9. Uh, Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness? And here's the problem. The people of that day did not understand that righteousness or the faith that we're given is is that's all it takes. We, we cannot, some of the people were saying, well, you got to do everything perfect by the law. If you mess up, then, you know, you, you're not saved. And that's not the case at all. And that's what he's talking about here. Know then that those, uh, those of faith who are the sons of Abraham and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So it's our faith in Jesus Christ. But the thing is, is if we want to be a, a, a tool of God's use, 
then we need to follow his instructions. Salvation comes not through what we do, but through our faith. You know, what are we going to do with that? And that's where his instructions comes in. And that's the part that people forget about is, okay, we, we, we've got faith, we're saved. We can just go on doing what we're doing. We don't need to follow his, his commands anymore. And, you know, we're not good enough to even be righteous. It's through him that we have that. So we have to, now we have to get it into um, um, learning how to be a, a Christian, how to be a light, how to draw people to us. And that is through following his word and studying it and in practicing, practicing it. Yeah. Uh, Genesis 15, 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Now, remember, God said to Abraham, do something. And what did Abraham do? He just he didn't ask why. He just did it. And there's a lot of things God tells us to do. And I've come to the conclusion that I'm not going to ask why. I'm just going to do it. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. The man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars, if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, You shall, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and it counted to him as righteousness. Um, Isaiah 59, 17, He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in the zeal of a cloak. Just kind of recapping the helmet of salvation. 2 Samuel 22, 2 through 3 and 36. He said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I shall take refuge, my shield, my horn of salvation, my stronghold, and my refuge, and my Savior. You saved me from violence. You have given me the shield of your salvation, and your gentleness made me great. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation in my stronghold. I'm just hitting some of the highlights. Uh, 155 and 174 out of Psalms 119. Salvation is far from the wicked, or they do not seek your statutes. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver he hid me away. So by following what God says, we become an instrument of, of uh, in the spiritual battle. In this case, they call it a polished arrow. Therefore, I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And my judgment goes forth as the light. Hosea 6, 5, the word of the God, you know, spoken and written word. Revelations 2, 16, or Revelation 2, 16. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Revelation 9.15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword, which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread on the wine presses of the fury and of the wrath of God the Almighty. For the word of God is a living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Did you know that in each one of our uh, cells, there's DNA, which is a language of itself? I, and Yeah, I've, I've looked at a little bit of it. Yeah. Go, go ahead. I'm well, and the, the, that language, you know, when everything was created, it was created through God by speaking. So if he can create everything through speaking, he can tear it apart by speaking. And that's what we're talking about here. And everything that we have in our cells, there's a language. And there's a library in every cell. You know, so we have the written word in us. Now, does that blow your mind? Mm. <laughs> yeah. <huh. laughs> that was my, my reaction, too. I got to think on this one. There's a lot there to unpack.
Okay, remember Paul's experience guides his letters. The armor of God is not a new invention, but an amalgamation of metaphors. We talked about this earlier, used in the First Testament. And we went through all those. Paul got, or not all of them, but several of them. Paul gathers these ideas and brings them to life in the same metaphor, giving the reader a sense of urgency, confidence, training, and knowledge. And, of course, we have two offensive weapons, the sword of the Spirit and the Word of God, his voice, his body, and his written word. And praying in the Spirit, knowing God's will, and praying as led by the Spirit. So we have to understand God's will, and he tells us that all through the Bible. And, you know, a lot of folks want to say that first two-thirds of the Bible we don't have to worry about anymore. Well, that's his will. That's where his will is located for the most part. So praying at all times in the spirit, the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we've got to be start where the spirit starts. Ephesians 31 or Exodus 31, 3. And I have filled him with the spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship. Again, the spirit of the God causes that to happen. 1 Samuel 10, 10, when they came to Gil. Gilba, behold, a group of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God rushed upon him, and he prophesied them among them. Second Chronicles 24 20, then the Spirit of God clothed Zechariah, the son of Jehoda, Jehoda, the priest, and he stood above the people and said to them, Thus says God, Why do you break the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has forsaken you. And through that prophecy, it was the Spirit of God. And the Spirit lifted me up, brought me in the vision of the Spirit of God in Chaldea to the exiles. Then the vision that I had seen went up from me, Ezekiel eleven twenty four. 24. Again, he's prophesying. And then we'll start at 18b on the armor of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints and also for me. So praying for each other that the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to uh, proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in change that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So he's talking about this mystery of the gospel. And there's more to that. It's the coming together of the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. We talked about this a little bit the other night. And that's part of that mystery. And being adopted back into the tree of God, because the, the the northern kingdom was sent out, and God divorced them and dispersed them to the nations, and now He's bringing everybody back together again, so we can be one um, uh, kingdom again, not not a northern kingdom or a southern kingdom, and not a kingdom, you know, no longer a part of God that was dispersed to the nations. He's bringing everybody back in, and He's also bringing people from the nations back in. And it's a you know that's a blessing, and that came through Abraham, and that's part of that mystery. We'll get into it a little bit more. We've talked about it prior to you coming, and so we've talked about it as well. But we'll get back into that some more. Uh, for which I am ambassador in change, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Ephesians six twenty one through twenty four, so that you may also, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. Tychius, 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 I'm sorry. The beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord will tell you everything. I've sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. So he's delivering this letter. Peace be to the brothers in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all of you. All who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. And so, again, a lot of the battle that we're seeing right now is happening in the mind. And the way we can uh, uh, come against that is knowing the word of God. And how did Jesus come against it when he was being tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights? He used scripture. He used the Old Testament, actually, Deuteronomy and Psalms. I believe is the, uh, where he pulled his scripture from, but that's how he fought um, Satan was that way. And and again, um, if we don't know our first testament, we're going to be lost. That's our that's and that's what Paul's drawn from. 
and uh, and the more I the more I study and the more I read, a uh, couple things that I've, I and we're going to talk about this more is that if we don't know the first testament, we don't know how to study the Bible. We don't know how to test to make sure things are accurate if we don't know that. If we're just going by the commentary, which is in the second testament, we, we don't understand. And that's why you have to be discipled. Not so much to have someone brainwash you. I don't I don't mean that. Um, that's not the right way to disciple people, I don't think. Say, okay, here, this is where we start. Start reading this and go through it. Now, if you have some questions, we can answer it. But you got to make sure that you're double checking what your uh, teacher is telling you too. Yes. I mean, because we're we're all going to be held accountable for that. And a lot of times, folks, up until last few years, um, people and I've started seeing just an explosion of what's going on. But people were just reading the old the the New Testament, and that's what they were going by, and they they didn't know. They said, well, Paul was saying the law is no good. Well, parts, you know, with, and again, not, not knowing what Paul was drawing from, we come to the wrong conclusions. Like Peter would say to our own, you know, if, if we're ignorant in that first testament, we're going to come to the wrong conclusions. Yeah. And, uh, and it's going to be our own folly. So that's why I want people to understand that. And it is important as soldiers of God, to understand what our marching orders are. And he gives us those marching orders in that first testament. Now, those marching orders are not good to anybody that isn't a, a child of God. Okay. So it would be like my family here in our house, we have certain rules that we go by, for instance. Um, and now do those rules apply to other families on the block? No, just here. You know, the dogs can go out whenever they want to. And, you know, I'm just being facetious. But, um, you know, I don't like them barking at the neighbor dogs. I'll go get them and bring them in. And they don't need to be doing that. But does that apply to everybody else's dogs? No. So God's rules and regulations and, uh, you know, his, uh, I was going to say postulates. I'm getting into the math side of it now. But um, his uh, uh, laws and, and precepts and, those things only apply to his people. And and they don't start applying until you become a child of God, if that makes sense. Yes. No, I, I understand what you you're see saying. You see what I'm saying? And so when, once we become a child of God, okay, now, for instance, I can go through a whole bunch of litany of things that everybody else needs to do. And, uh, and we, we'll talk about some of that stuff because that some of that stuff people have taken out of context and twisted it. Like Paul said, or like Peter said, mm -hmm. so that it um, works with them. Works for them, and when you put it back into context, it's like wow. But I want to. We'll get into that, and it and it can raise the hair and cause people to have heckles. And the reason I know this is because it did it to me. But I think it's important that people see it yes. and look at it. Um, and people are going to feel like I'm pointing fingers at them. Well, number one, I went through it already and i know it's not fun um it was something that i i listened to i didn't want to but i listened to it and it took me a while to work my way through it and for instance eating pork i don't eat pork anymore yeah. because of this now that wasn't something i came across and one night was like oh i'm not gonna eat pork anymore god worked on me for probably six months before i came to that conclusion and so i'm not gonna go tell people you know you need to do, need to do this you need to do that First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say it to myself. My problem now is not eating pork. It's not doing some of the other things. I'm overweight right now. I got to lose weight. I got to get into shape. And that's ungodly. And so that's something that I got to start working on. So I'm not, when we get into the next couple lessons, it's not there to be pointing fingers at people. It's just say, okay, here's, here's, what, here's what we've been doing. Here's how we have to look at it. And from a uh, how we interpret it from a, a biblical perspective and then once once that's given then people can make their make their own mind up pray about it and what i tell people is it doesn't matter when you're doing a bible study i'm going to turn this volume down 
I think the most important thing is it's not so much um, listen to other people talk. What's important is praying to God and saying, God, I want to listen to your word. I want to hear what you have to say. And I want to be humble enough to be that warrior that you want me to be for your kingdom. And if that means that I quit doing certain things that I really enjoy, then so be it. Like eating that crispy bacon or that good piece of ham. You know, and I say that kind of tongue in cheek, but those were hard things for me to give up. And you know, it's it's a it's difficult, but what did God give up for me? And we're asked to sacrifice daily. So what are we willing to sacrifice? But the other thing, too, just kind of give you a precursor. He tells us don't do like the pagans do. God, he tells us, he says, in, in through his scriptures in the, the First Testament, he says, don't do as the pagans do. Yes. And so one of the things I would go through and study is what were the pagans doing. I'm just going to leave that there. I'm not going to go any further. I'm going to let that kind of... Uh, eat on you for a little bit and do some checking but you know, it's like oh okay i don't want to be like the pagans i don't want to look like the world and you know what one of the biggest things that's helped me talk to people about god is when i ask do you put uh bacon bits on salad well yeah can you hold those bacon bits because i don't eat bacon why don't you eat bacon well i got a story for you <laughs> It just opens doors up sometimes, you know, and it's just, it's been a blessing that way, you know. So, anyway, that's kind of a precursor to what's going to come down the pike a little bit. All right, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight. We just thank you for Eli being here, and we thank you for your word and ask that it'll soak in and, and uh, that we can think on it and chew on it. Thank you, Father, for... Uh, just helping us out and being a great teacher and patient with us, Father. And we just like to be able to understand exactly what your word says and how we can be better warriors for your kingdom, Father. And we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.